President Trump appeared on CNN last night. The town hall was a big win for Trump. I don't just say it because I like the guy. Even liberal journalists and politicians are admitting it. It was a big win for Republicans in that the appearance taught us, by my count, five important facts about where the Trump campaign stands right now. And the appearance was even a big win for the libs, as they now have an excuse to prosecute Trump for committing murder on national television. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. In just a moment, we will answer a question that liberals raise very often, at least a few times a year. This one came from Joy Behar on The View. The question is, why don't the police just shoot people in the leg? A question that keeps the libs up at night. We'll get to that in a second. First, though, we've got to get through this town hall. If you didn't watch it, I recommend you watch the whole thing. It was absolutely delightful. It was delightful largely because Trump totally owned the libs with facts and logic, and it was it was just marvelous to watch. You kind of felt like you had that old energy back again, right? But the reason that I want to cover it, and I'll, I'll try to do it relatively quickly, I want to hit on five points because I think that the Trump town hall appearance, beyond delighting everybody with Trump's zingers, uh, showed us five important things about his 2024 campaign. First one is Trump is going to bring receipts. They were breaking into the Capitol, smashing windows, injuring police officers. Why did you, why did it take you three hours to tell them to go home? I don't believe it did. Oh, let me pull it out. I have to pull it out. So if you look at, on January 5th, the day before, I said, please support our Capitol Police and law enforcement. They are truly on the side of our country. Stay peaceful. Stay peaceful. This was the day before, and this was in the form of Twitter. Now use truth, truth social. I think it's far superior, okay? I hope everybody's on truth. I hope everybody's on truth. Uh, if you look, January 6th, this is two, before 2.30, I am asking for everyone at the U.S. Capitol to remain peaceful. This is right after as it was happening. But what happened is they took it down. I don't know why. I think they took it down because it was so good. They didn't like it being up there. (laughs) I am asking. This is and we didn't know until I got it back, because now I have 90 million people waiting for me to go back. But I'm on truth and I'm staying on truth. You didn't say anything for 700 hours after. Actually, I did. Boom. And he just pulls out that sheet of paper. This was, in a way, an answer to that infamous incident between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama and Candy Crowley, the moderator, I think also from CNN, back in 2012, when Mitt Romney said, you didn't call the Benghazi terror attack a terror attack until long after the attack. And Candy Crowley intervened on Barack Obama's behalf and said, actually, he did. Governor, he did. And then it turned out she was just making that up. That wasn't true. This was kind of the opposite, where you had the moderator or the hostess, Caitlin Collins. She says, you didn't talk about this for hours and hours. And Trump says, oh, I got my own receipts. Here we go. Uh, Good to know that. It's good to know that Trump is going to have the facts at his fingertips when you hear all of these kinds of charges that are inevitably going to come up throughout the 2024 campaign. Next thing it showed us is that Trump is thoughtful. Trump is thinking in a nuanced way about major political issues, notably foreign policy. Do you want Ukraine to win this war? Uh, I don't think in terms of winning and losing. I think in terms of getting it settled so we stop killing all these people and breaking down this this country. You but said one you of the don't think you in have terms to do of winning is you have losing. to get the, you have Mr. to President, get Europe. can I just follow up on that because that's a really no, important statement me, let me that just you just made up. there. Can you say if you want Ukraine or Russia to win this war? I want everybody to stop dying. They're dying. Russians and Ukrainians. I want them to stop dying. And I'll have that done. I'll have that done in 24 hours. I'll have it done. You need the power of the presidency to do it. But you but won't say that you want Ukraine to win. You, you know what I'll you say? In, I'll say this. I want Europe to put up more money because they're in for 20 billion. We're in for 170, and they should an be. And they should the equalize. They have plenty of money. They should equalize. 
This is a very thoughtful answer on Ukraine. The liberal view on Ukraine is rah, rah, World War III, let's start dropping bombs on Moscow. Let's go after the Kremlin, let's assassinate Putin. Forget about just chasing Russian influence out of Ukraine. We want Ukraine to go in and <laughs> let's have them invade Russia. Let's, let's go, baby, NATO on the move. That's the liberal view. The conservative view is a little more restrained than that. It's a little bit more conservative. The conservative view is the view that has been articulated by statesmen going back 30 years now, by George Kennan, author of The Long Telegram, by people like Henry Kissinger, by people like Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Sam Nunn, people who said, you know, we've got to be a little bit careful about how NATO expands and actually buffer states aren't the worst thing in the world because they, they mediate between great powers. And so what are we going to do here in Ukraine? Are we really going to rout Russia? We're going to call for regime change in Russia. What are we going to do? We're going to get Russia out of Crimea. What are we going to do? We're going to invite Ukraine to join NATO. What, is that really going to de-escalate this situation? Or no, is that going to send us hurtling toward World War III? Well, you've got China aggressing in Taiwan and the South China Sea. That doesn't seem to make sense. And so, so Trump knows this. Trump knows that if he says, I want Ukraine to win, first of all, you're going to just be affirming what Russia's already said, which is that the U.S. is a belligerent in the Ukraine war. And the U.S. is not just waging a kind of cold war here, that the U.S. is waging a hot war with Russia. You're only going to escalate that, which is what all the liberals and the hawks are doing on this particular issue. And Trump says, no, I just want to wind down the conflict, which a lot of wise statesmen think the United States could do if it felt that it were in its interest to wind down the conflict. So really nuanced answer here from Trump. Not just a total dove, not just a total hawk. He's giving a thoughtful answer. The next thing we learned about Trump is that the guy is still super funny. I never met this woman. I never saw this woman. This woman said, I met her at the front door of Bergdorf Goodwin, which I rarely go into other than for a couple of charities. I met her in the front door. She was about 60 years old, and this is like 22, 23 years ago. I met her in the front door of Bergdorf Goodman. I was immediately attracted to her, and she was immediately attracted to me. And we had this great chemistry. We're walking into a crowded department, so we had this great chemistry. And a few minutes later, we end up in a, a room, a dressing room of Bergdorf Goodman, <laughs> right near the cash register. And then she found out there are locks on the door. So she said, I found one that was open. She found one. She learned this at trial. She found one that was open. What kind of a woman meets somebody and brings them up, and within minutes you're playing hanky-panky in a dressing room, okay? <laughs> I don't know if he was, she was married then or not. John Johnson, I feel sorry for you, John Johnson. Mr. President, can I, can no, I but think, think of it. They said he didn't rape her. And did I didn't do anything else either. You know what? Because I have no idea who the hell she is. But Mr. President, I don't know can, who I, this woman can I ask you, given your recounting, I don't your know version, who, and, and I tell you this. But Mr. President, are you ready? Can I, can I, and I can swear I ask on you my children, which I never do, I have no idea who this woman is. This is a fake story, made up story. So it's really funny, I, because we could only put a short clip in there, you might lose a little bit of the context that when he's recounting that tale at the beginning, he's saying this is her version of events. I walk into Bergdorf Goodman, which I pretty much never did, and I'm in a crowded department store, and then the whole rest of it, it reads like a romance novel. And that last part, I think, is important, too, because Trump obviously has engaged in hyperbole, exaggeration, let's say a little bending of the truth every now and again. And he was a billionaire playboy for a long time. But at the end there, when he says, listen to me, I swear on my children and I never do that. I have no idea who this woman is. I, this did not happen. One feels that that is sincere. One has the impression that that is sincere. And he's funny the whole time. It's the only way to deflate this. They're, they're accusing him of the worst things you can be accused of. They're accusing him of rape, okay? They're accu and he's saying, had, either you say, no, I didn't do it, kind of like when, when someone who wants to set you up, they say, hey, do you still beat your wife? And any way you answer, you, you look bad. And so what does he do? He just makes fun of the whole situation, of this romance novel situation that, that appeared on an episode of Law & Order SVU seven years before the woman published her claims. He mocks it. He hits you with sincerity. It's very persuasive on the campaign trail. And then the final point that we learned from the, the CNN town hall, and this is the most important thing, I think, for the Trump campaign to convey to the GOP base, is that Trump, this go-round at least, intends to be disciplined. You still have not publicly acknowledged 
the 2020 election results. Why should Americans put you back in the White House? Because uh, we did fantastically. We got 12 million more votes than we had in, uh, as you know, in 2016. Uh, I actually say we did far better in that election. Got the most uh, that anybody's ever gotten as a sitting president of the United States. Uh, I think that uh, when you look at that result and when you look at what happened during that election, uh, unless you're a very stupid person, you see what happens. A lot of the people, a lot of the people in this audience and probably maybe a couple that don't, but most people uh, understand what happened. That was a rigged election. And it's a shame that we had to go through it. It's very bad for our country all over the world. They looked at it. Mr. President, back to what you just said there, though. It, it was not a rigged election. It was not a stolen election. You and your supporters lost more than 60 court cases on the election. It's been nearly two and a half years. Can you publicly acknowledge that you did lose the 2020 election? Let me, let me just go on. If you look at True the Vote, they found <laughs> millions of votes on camera, on government cameras, where uh, they were stuffing ballot boxes. There's even more to it. We had to, we had to cut the clip to keep it a little, little tighter for the show. Trump at that first debate with Joe Biden would never have allowed that woman to get her nonsense interjection in there. Oh, Mr. President, actually, fact check, you lost, you lost, the election was not rigged. It was totally the most fair, wonderful beep boop election in beep beep boop. There were no questions about, and had this been the, the first debate of 2020, had this been a less disciplined campaign, Trump would have come in and gotten into a shouting match with her and gone back and forth. He exhibited incredible restraint there. In fact, he exhibited more restraint than I just exhibited, even listening to what she had to say. And there is no question in my mind that that was intentional. And it's to convey to the GOP base that this campaign is going to be disciplined. The, the most important line of the night, most important line of the night did not come during the town hall. The most important line of the night, and probably the line that bodes best for Trump's campaign, came before the town hall when Trump announced it. I'll be doing CNN tonight, live from the great state of New Hampshire, because CNN is rightfully desperate to get those fantastic Trump ratings back. They were ratings like none other, and they want them back. So I was sitting with sweet little Elisa last night, and we were listening to, to the town hall. And Elisa said to me, she goes, seriously, though, why, why did CNN agree to do this town hall? And then just before I could answer, she answered it herself. She goes, is it literally just because they want those fantastic Trump ratings? And the answer is yes. And this is why Trump is going to get all that free media. He got billions of dollars worth of free media in 2016. This is why CNN is going to have him back on. This is why they're all going to have him back on. This is why his poll numbers are going up, because you can't look away. You might say, well, other political candidates, they've sh- proven themselves to be more effective at wielding power or more, more nuanced about policy or... Maybe that's true. I'm not even going to weigh in there. I'm just telling you this guy is a singular political talent. He's an American original. His worst aspects are American original. His best aspects are American original, okay? There's no copy of him. Now, there are other candidates in the race, and there's one candidate who is posing something of a challenge to him. And while Trump is demonstrating his campaign prowess on TV. This other guy is passing some really important legislation down in the state of Florida, which we'll get to in one second. First though, how do you sleep at night? I sleep better knowing that we maybe have a chance at winning 2024. And I I sleep better regardless of the election because of Helix Sleep. Right now, go to helixsleep.com slash Knowles. With everything going on in the world right now, you could really use a good night's sleep. That's why you got to check out Helix Mattress. Helix has harnessed years of extensive mattress expertise to bring their customers a truly elevated sleep experience. They just launched their new Helix Elite. The Helix Elite collection includes six different mattress models, each tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. I've had my Helix for three years now, probably, and I absolutely love it. Night after night, I sleep like a sweet baby, and I want the same for you. Helix has a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress. Because why would you buy a mattress made for someone else, okay? You want to be in my mattress? I'm a married man. Get out of my boudoir. Go to helixsleep.com slash Take their two-minute sleep quiz to find the perfect mattress for your body 
and sleep type. Their flexible payment plans make it so that a great night's sleep is never far away. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Hurry on over to helixsleep.com slash Knowles. With Helix, better sleep starts now. So while Trump is dazzling on CNN, what's going on with his primary opponent, Ron DeSantis? He's passing some really important stuff down in Florida. A very different approach to campaigning. Trump putting on the old razzle-dazzle. DeSantis keeping his head mostly down, just trying to rack up those legislative wins to give him more ammo going into the campaign once he officially announces. So really great news at the New College of Florida. This is a public liberal arts school in Florida that Ron DeSantis has taken a a particular interest in reforming. And some new reform that has been brought to that college is that the school will start to accept the classic learning test, which is an alternative to the SAT. It's a standardized college entrance exam that is meant for students with classical and Christian educations. So whereas the SAT and the ACT increasingly are geared toward people who have received lib crazy educations, the classical learning test will focus on the older, more traditional, superior kind of education. DeSantis also recently appointed six conservative uh, leaders and academics to the new College of Florida Board of Trustees. The point of this is to purge the leftists out of that school and to uh, wield some political power. DeSantis on top of that just signed E-Verify into law in Florida. So employers are going to have to make sure that the people they're hiring are not illegal aliens. Florida becomes the largest state in the country to do so. So it's a very different campaign, at least in these early stages. What DeSantis is betting on is that he can keep his head down, rack up win after win after win, not get too much fanfare, not get too much pushback. And then when he makes his announcement, he can say, look at my list of accomplishments. Uh, Maybe I don't have the razzle dazzle. Maybe I'm not the entertainer or the showman that Donald Trump is, but I can get the job done. And Trump's campaign is going to say, I'm a unique figure. The libs uniquely hate me, which tells you that maybe I'm the man for the job. I uniquely am able to own these guys on TV with facts and logic and my zingers. We didn't include half the zingers in this. And so you got to vote for me because... I break the mold because the the way that the political structure is set up, it is rigged against Republicans. I uniquely break that mold. DeSantis is going to say, well, I got reelected by a huge margin in Florida and you, Donald Trump, lost the 2020 election. This is why Donald Trump has to continue to focus on the way in which that election was rigged. And I know a lot of people want to say that there were no problems with the 2020 election. I don't know. Look at Pennsylvania. Look at the way they changed the election laws to contradict even the state constitution there. Look at those pipes bursting in the middle of the night. Look at how long it took to count the ballots. I look at the way that they spread widespread mail. And I think it's not a distraction for the Trump campaign to keep mentioning, not to harp on it, but to keep mentioning the issues with the 2020 election. Because the biggest attack on Trump is that he lost to Joe Biden once. How's he going to beat him the second time? So they have to focus on that. They're running, very, they're running in the same lane, Trump and DeSantis, but they're running very, very different campaigns. One of them just got a big showcase. Let's, let's see what happens when DeSantis finally goes out there. Now, Trump is not the only Republican politician that the liberal establishment is trying to throw behind bars. Another one would be the colorful representative from New York, George Santos. It's a witch hunt because <laughs> it, it, it makes no sense that in four months, four months, five months, I'm indicted. You have Joe Biden's entire family receiving deposits from nine, nine family members receiving money from foreign, from foreign destinations into their bank accounts. It's been years of exposing. A lot of you here have reported on them, and yet no investigation is launched into them. I'm gonna fight I well, and I'm just going I'm getting back to that. I'm gonna fight my battle, I'm gonna deliver, I'm gonna fight the witch, and I'm gonna take care of clearing my name, and I look forward to doing that. So we've got a 13 count indictment against George Santos, the the Republican representative from New York who lied about his education and his professional background, possibly his sexual desires, maybe his ethnic 
or religious background. It's all, it's a little bit unclear. The 13 count indictment is the kitchen sink. It's everything. He committed wire fraud. They say he took a $500 unemployment check when he really was working. I mean, everything they could find, they threw at this guy. And uh, he made false statements to the House of Representatives, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I'm not downplaying this. I think fraud is pretty much the worst crime you can commit. I think it is pretty much the worst sin you can commit. I think that there's a reason that uh, Dante puts the fraudsters in almost the very lowest pit of hell. So I'm not defending any of that, but I am looking at the political system and I'm wondering, hold on, the same day that we see evidence that pretty much the entire Biden family was on the take committing the same kinds of crimes that they're accusing George Santos of, in some cases, worse crimes because the Bidens had more power and more influence that they could sell to make money from some of the worst people on earth. You're telling me we're going to go after this random congressman who's been in office for five seconds? For these, it's, it's, it's like going after a, a, a drug dealer for you know, selling a dime bag of marijuana, but you're going to let the cartel leaders off the hook. Are you kidding me? What is this about? would seem to me that Republicans have a razor-thin majority in the House of Representatives. They won an unlikely seat in New York. They see a particularly weak member of Congress that they can pinch off, and then that's going to turn the, the Republicans' thin majority into an even thinner majority. And it's, it does not seem to me to be based on principles or the blind execution of justice. This seems to me, not quite a witch hunt. I'm sure George Santos did all sorts of terrible things, but it seems to me a selective prosecution by the liberal establishment to weaken Republicans. And I don't think Republicans should give this any quarter at all. I think we should totally ignore this nonsense. We should, as a political matter, defend George Santos, at least against the predations of a corrupt Biden DOJ. I wouldn't trust George Santos with $5 to go get me a cup of coffee. But I'm not going to throw this guy under the bus. I'm not going to say he should be prosecuted. I'm not saying he should resign from Congress. No way. Give up the Bidens. Put the Bidens in orange jumpsuits and then talk to me about George freaking Santos. Give me a break. Absolutely insane. Now, speaking of hauling people away and hauling things away, when you have got your friends coming over for a barbecue, you're probably going to have to go haul off that propane tank, haul back on a new propane tank. Well, how about you make it all easy with Cinch? Right now, go to cinch.com, use promo code Knowles. The weather is warming up over here in Nashville, which means that we are gearing up for backyard barbecues and campfires. The last thing you need to be doing when you're getting ready to host a barbecue is driving around worrying about where to refill your propane grill tank. That is why you got to check out Cinch. Cinch is a propane grill tank home delivery service. They deliver propane grill tanks right to your door. Cinch delivers on your schedule, requires no long-term commitment or subscription. Plus, delivery is completely contactless. You don't have to wait around at home. Track the order on the Cinch app from anywhere. Whether you're grilling steaks or firing up the patio heaters on a cold night, Cinch's propane delivery service ensures that you have the fuel you need to make the most of every moment. Go online to cinch.com or download the Cinch app to order. New customers can get their first tank exchange for just $10 with promo code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. That is cinch.com or download the Cinch app. Use promo code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to get your first tank exchange for just $10. It's a limited time offer. You must live within the Cinch service area to redeem it. Visit cinch, C-Y-N-C-H dot com slash offer for details. You know, if we are made in the image and likeness of God, it means that there is an ethical and spiritual infrastructure to reality. We are supposed to behave according to the God who made us in his image. Exodus features a roundtable of uh, wonderful minds who have gathered to discuss topics like this through one of the most important books in the Bible. There's an irony here that for all the insistence upon equality, the very foundation for that equality in Western culture, i.e. the idea that <clears throat> human beings are made in the imago Dei, in the image of God, has been lost, of mm -hmm. course. So it's almost as if, because of the erosion of this foundation, 
the drive for equality is stressed yeah. all the more. Well, that's that's it, exactly what Nietzsche. That's exactly what Nietzsche claimed would happen when he wrote. Well, when he's particularly in Beyond Good and Evil, he said that was that was an inevitable. That would be an inevitable consequence. All episodes of Exodus are now available exclusively for Daily Wire Plus members. If you haven't seen it, start at the beginning. It is well worth your time. Join now at dailywire.com slash subscribe to watch Exodus. Speaking of scams and scammers, not quite. We'll move on from George Santos and the Biden DOJ. We will focus on something that isn't even human. Focus on AI. There's a story, it came out last month, but it's just starting to get some attention, of a new AI scam. You could find yourself picking up the phone, hearing a desperate plea from a loved one in the voice of that loved one, begging for money to be sent to that person's kidnappers, and it could all be a scam. This mom got the scariest phone call of her life. On the other end, she hears her daughter crying. She's like, Mom, I messed up, as she's crying and sobbing. Then a man gets on the line and claims he's kidnapped her 15-year-old daughter, Bree. He's like, listen here, I've got your daughter. You're not going to call anybody. You're not going to call the cops. And I just um, put the phone on mute and started screaming for help. The kidnappers demand $1 million before reducing it to 50000 I, at that point, started screaming at them that I want to talk to my daughter again, which they refused. But here's the thing. Her daughter had not been kidnapped, and that was not her begging mom for help. Her voice had been duplicated by a scammer using artificial intelligence. It's Allison. This is going to be hard to believe, but I've been kidnapped. They want one million ransom. Otherwise, they say they'll hurt me. I don't know what's going to happen. They want me to hang up now. I've got to go. I love you. That's pretty creepy. It's very creepy. It isn't quite there yet. There, there are these software programs where you can just put in 30 seconds, one minute of voice audio, and, and they will be able to clone your voice and then spit out whatever you type in in 60 seconds. It costs nothing. It could cost $5 a month. But it's not quite there yet. You'd assume if you were being kidnapped and held for a million dollars ransom, you'd probably wouldn't say, hello there, mom. I'm very nervous about being murdered by my kidnappers. Please send a million dollars. I love you. But it's pretty close. And there have been similar scams in recent years. This happened to my grandparents, actually. My grandparents got a call from a guy who said, hey, it's your, your grandson, and you know I need this amount of money. And they gave some details about this cousin of mine, their grandson, and luckily they kind of got tipped off that things were a little strange and my grandpa handed the phone to my grandma or vice versa, something like that. And they figured out what it was. But imagine if the phone call had been in the person's voice. You're going to see this proliferate. It it won't just be six months, two years from now. This is going to happen everywhere like tomorrow. And this ties into a story from the top cyber spy over in Britain, former top cyber spy, who says that AI fakes and lies are going to destroy society. So uh, this uh, uh, professor, CRN Martin, is just the latest figure, or top figure from the tech world, to say that AI is going to, quote, undermine the fabric of our society because we're not going to be able to trust anything. He says, quote, AI is now making it much easier to fake things, much easier to spoof voices, much easier to look like genuine information, much easier to put that out at scale. So having a sense of what is true and reliable, it's going to become much more difficult. And that's something that risks undermining the fabric of our society. This is a fair thing to be worried about. If you can't tell the difference between truth and falsehood, then you can't have a functioning society. This is just an acceleration of the problem of transgenderism. This is why people are so focused on transgenderism, is not just because of the sexual fetishes of a handful of people, and not even because of the social contagion, and not even because it's now affecting children, but because transgenderism is a means to transhumanism. Because with transgenderism, the premise is we can't really know what a man is and what a woman is. And so you might be a fella who wants to have a normal traditional life. And if somehow the surgeries and the procedures became advanced enough that they actually worked. And now if a man tries to chop himself up to look like a woman, you can tell. You can 99.9% of the time, it's pretty clear that the 
the dude who looks like a lady is really a dude or vice versa. But let's say it did become more advanced, you would not be able to know. And so your inability to discern the truth would certainly affect your life. It'd be very awkward when the two of you try to have children. You know, at 10 years into your marriage, you, you decide, okay, maybe we're going to have a child. And the guy says, oh, actually, um, funny story. I'm actually a dude, but I, you know, so that, that would be part of it. Um, and the, the transhumanism aspect is that we're just going to modify our bodies to such a degree that we're totally untethered from reality. But I think there's a silver lining to the storm cloud, which is, yes, deep fakes and cloned voices and fake images and videos, it's going to make it hard to know whether that, that video of a politician caught in a scandal, whether that's real, whether that means that we should kick the guy out of Congress or the Senate, or is it just a fake? Pretty soon, we're not going to be able to know. I, in some ways, political scandals will probably abate because even if you catch the guy dead to rights, he's got three hookers and a, a big bag of crack cocaine and you got him on three different cameras. The politician could probably just say, yeah, well, it's a fake. It's a deep fake, and you can't prove otherwise. Okay, yeah, that's a bad thing. But th the silver lining to that is politics, I think, then is going to become much more local, much more immediate. It's going to return to being more incarnational, physical. We're, we're going to f f be forced to think beyond science, okay, back to the real human, tangible stuff. Say, so I don't know if that phone call I just heard is real. I don't know if that video I just saw is real, but I'm talking to a politician right in front of me, and I know that guy is real. I'm at the town hall. I'm in the town square. I'm going to, I don't know if I can believe the nonsense coming out of Brussels or the Washington, D.C. or wherever, but I, I can trust the people in my local community. You could see a return to tradition. In, in fact, you are seeing that now. One of the big reactions against our increasingly technocratic, metaverse, virtual reality kind of society is to leave it, to leave the cities, to go out, get a little bit of land, maybe get some chickens. I don't know. Maybe you're going to leave the school system. You're going to start homeschooling your kids. You're going to take a much more active role in the life of your own family. And that means an investment of time and energy and just your physical presence. That's the reaction. Now, is that going to compensate for the vast majority of people who are just going to plug themselves into the matrix and that's that? Maybe not, but it will present an alternative. Now, speaking of local politics, E. Jean Carroll is the woman who accused Trump of raping her 27 or 28 years ago. We don't really remember. And actually, it wasn't rape. Oh, no, actually, it was rape. And uh, I know the jury didn't find him liable for rape, but so they think that I'm lying about that. But maybe I, was, maybe I should still get $5 million anyway. So this lady, clearly a little, little strange. We then just got an answer to one of the strangest questions about this whole civil suit against Trump, which is, how is it that you can take a guy to court for something that allegedly happened 27, 28 years ago, long after the statute of limitations runs out, not only on a criminal case, but even on the civil case. How is, oh, because there was this law that was passed in 2022 to create a temporary window where you could take someone to a civil court for something that happened decades ago on issues like sexual assault and rape. And why did that law get passed? Can I end on something that I think um, is really important in all of this? And it's the fact that New York passed this law, yeah. the Adult Survivors Act. They passed it just a few years ago. Were it not for that law, you never would have been able to bring this case. And I just think it speaks to the importance for a lot of other survivors. Exactly. This would never, I would never have this window, this year of having the ability uh, to bring a lawsuit for rape. Robbie can explain it better. Well, EJ actually helped to get that law passed. It passed last year. So E. Jean Carroll's attorney here just made a big mistake. She said the part that the libs were trying to conceal, which is, oh yeah, they did it for us. We got that law passed. They did it. The whole point of that law was to bring Trump to trial. It had nothing to do with victims of rape or sexual assault. It was just another way to get Trump. So it was specifically for our case. 
that you can see the CNN hosts. Oh, no, we're, if not for that wonderful law, don't tell them that they did it for you to get Trump. And then you can hear from E. Jean Carroll, this woman, whatever you think about Trump, this woman is not all there. We played the Anderson Cooper interview yesterday from 2019, where she goes on about how, oh, he didn't really rape her, and actually rape is sexy, and wow, Anderson, you're fascinating to talk to. And she's just, she's the Christine Blasey Ford of 2023. Remember Christine Blasey Ford, the accuser against Brett Kavanaugh, and the media portrayed her as this dignified woman finally coming forward after what, like 50 years or something, uh, she's going to come forward and tell her truth, finally have rape. And then whenever she would get on the microphone, she sounded like a complete looney tune. And her details of her story were changing constantly. And then certain facts that she stated turned out to be lies, demonstrable, proven lies. And then there was no evidence that she ever even met Brett Kavanaugh. And you almost didn't want to blame Christine Blasey Ford because every time she spoke, she sounded like she was couple fries away from a happy meal, okay? Not, not, not all there. And the same is true of this woman. So E. Jean Carroll, she says, yes, we ha- came forward. We had to come forward. Okay, let's let my attorney do all the talking now. I don't, what are we talking about? What's this about? You're a fascinating person to talk to. Christine Blasey Ford, part two. Speaking of law enforcement, there's some good news coming out of Texas. The whole story today is little silver linings in big gray storm clouds. We have 10,000 people plus per day, foreign nationals pouring across our southern border because we effectively don't have a southern border anymore. And that's because Joe Biden has intentionally opened up that border by repealing Title 42. So you've got all these people pouring across the border. Biden sends some troops down to the border, but not to repel the invasion. He just sent the troops down to go help the border patrol agents process the people coming into the country. He sent the troops down to help facilitate the invasion. So fortunately, the governors also have a say about the state national guards. And so uh, Governor Greg Abbott down in Texas called to the Texas National Guard down there, and they weren't shooting people, and they weren't clubbing people on the head. They were just standing at these border points, these illegal points of border entry, and stopping the foreign nationals from coming through and turned them around. Really great stuff. And it teaches you an important lesson about politics, not just about immigration, not just about who should come in, not just about should we allow four million, four and a half million people come into the country every year, or maybe try to limit it to just three and a half million or wherever the ridiculous immigration debate is today. No, it teaches you a lesson about subsidiarity. Subsidiarity is a deeply conservative principle. And you can see the principle of subsidiarity in the American founding. You can see the principle of subsidiarity in the Habsburg Empire. Okay, it's, It doesn't matter the scale of your political community. The principle of subsidiarity means that you will push down to the most local level decisions that can competently and appropriately be made by that local level. So you're not going to usurp power at the higher, more centralized level when those decisions and that power can be exercised at a lower level. And and that's what's going to work. Washington, D.C., controlled by the libs, is never going to stop illegal immigration. They are only going to encourage it. It is in their political interest. Either it doesn't affect them at all, and so they'll be negligent and not do anything about it, or they actually want to undermine the border because it helps the Democrats politically. Either way, you cannot rely on Washington, D.C. to do it. The only way that we're going to repel any of these waves of migration, it's going to be through the conservative states. California is obviously not going to do it, but states like Texas perhaps will. And Greg Abbott showed that that could happen yesterday. Now, I've got some bad news for you. It's bittersweet. Once again, My game, Yes or No, the greatest board game on the internet, has sold out at dailywire.com slash shop. You can't say I didn't tell you so. I warned you. I said the first time we ordered a thousand of these games, sold out almost instantly. Next time we ordered many thousands more games, I said, guys, you got to get it now. It's going to sell out. And then some people waited a little too long. Well, okay. The creme de la creme who managed to get their hands on a copy, you got it. It's coming. 
For the rest of you who missed out, do not despair. You can still pre-order the game over at dailywire.com slash shop. Do not miss out on getting the greatest game on the internet. We've got more exciting stuff coming about the yes or no game. All right, I'm just going to, that's a little teaser for you. Make sure you get your copy though now. Pre-order it if you have not ordered it already. My favorite comment yesterday is from Susan Bailey, who says, the actual verdict in the Trump trial, we don't think Trump did anything to this woman, but we hate him. Yes, that's true. They passed the law to allow this to go to trial strictly to get Trump. It had nothing to do even with the preposterous allegation that the woman made against him. Now, speaking of law enforcement, if you've ever had a conversation with a lib about gun control, if you've ever been kind of a lib yourself, which some of us have gone through more lib phases of our lives, okay, there but for the grace of God, go we. You may have heard this argument. I'll say, why did that private citizen who was protecting himself and his family and his property against a criminal, why did he have to shoot the criminal in the chest? Why couldn't he just shoot the criminal in the leg? And that way the criminal could live, maybe, and he would still be able to stop the bad guy. Why did the cops, those terrible, awful cops, why, when they were in a shootout with a a criminal, why didn't they just shoot him in his ankle? And that way they could stop the bad guy, maybe, and he wouldn't have to die. Joy Behar just raised this question on The View. I don't understand why people go for the for the. De- it's like police sometimes when they shoot somebody. It's like can't you shoot them in the leg? Why do you have to shoot well, them in the head? Well, that's a false. Actually, having dated a homicide detective, <laughs> he used to tell me when he hears that on TV, his eyes roll because you have to shoot when you're trained with a weapon for the mass of the body. So to shoot a leg or a wrist happens in a James Bond film, but in real life, that's actually not something that why? they can do. Why? Because it's hard enough to hit a target. So when you, you're shot, you you target practice on a mass, which is the main part of your body. Your torso. So if it's hard to hit a target, why do these gun toters want us to constantly have guns when we're not trained to even shoot as well as a police officer? So she tries to save her stupid question. She goes, well, then why does it, why, why do they want us to have guns if we're completely untrained? I don't want you to have a gun if you don't know how to use it. That's a straw man. I certainly don't want people who are completely ignorant about what firearms do and how to use them. I do not want any of you to have a firearm for your own sake as much as for the rest of us because if you don't know how to use a firearm, it's probably not going to work out well for you. If you don't know how to hold a firearm, if you don't know how to use it when there's a bad guy approaching, most likely the bad guy's just gonna take it from you and use it on you. So no, we we want people to be responsible and trained and be knowledgeable about these things that they're using. This is the consequence of ignorance. Very often, the people who are the loudest activists, very often the people in office who are regulating all of these rights and instruments in our society, they don't even understand the mechanics of the things that they're regulating. Not only do they not understand the philosophy of why we have a Second Amendment, of why we have a right to protect ourselves, of what, where that comes from, what that means, they don't even understand how the pew-pew thing works. They don't even know what the trigger does. They don't know what it's like. Their, their understanding, as that woman on The View said, their understanding of shooting a gun comes from James Bond movies. Oh, well, why did the cops have to, have to stand there and shoot the guy in the chest. Why didn't they just run up, jump sideways, hold the gun sideways, and, and shoot the, the gun out of the other bad guy's hand? You know, come on, I saw that in a movie once. Why can't they just do that? These people have never been to a gun range. They've probably never held a gun in their lives. And this is true beyond gun policy. This is true at all levels of politics. The people who are doing the regulating increasingly don't understand anything about what they are regulating. The people who are, who are passing laws about abortion, the left-wingers passing laws about abortion, increasingly, they don't have children, so they t- physically don't understand what it's like to have a baby. They often have not become pregnant. It's kind of like an inversion of the lib, uh, libs argument. If you're a man, you shouldn't be able to have an opinion about abortion. Well, okay, is the same true of a childless woman? It's the same true of a single woman who doesn't want to 
That, well, that's one aspect of knowledge, but then there are more important degrees of knowledge. I don't need to have cancer to learn something about cancer. A doctor doesn't need to have cancer to know how to treat cancer. I don't need to have committed a murder to know how to pass a law against murder. I don't need to have been a cop to pass a law against murder. What is required, though, is some basic understanding of morality, ethics, philosophy, theology, ultimately. You need to know these things. In order to be a statesman, you should have a serious education in all of these subjects. You should be able to understand what the law even is, not just the positive law that we all pass and we vote upon the bill on Capitol Hill, but what the law even means. Is the law merely an imposition of my will because I want such and such to be so in society? Or is the law primarily a matter of interpretation, that there is such a thing as the natural law, that there are eternal principles of justice, and, and there, there is an objective moral order, and we can perceive this and, and interpret this, and then through a process of translation, translate the eternal moral order into the positive law and the civil law and all the rest of it. Is that, of course that's what law is. Well, okay, that means we need to know something about ethics and morality. Well, what is more, where do we get our notions of good and bad from? How can we know anything at all? The people passing our laws increasingly don't know anything about that. Now, before we go, I'm just going to tease something before we go, okay? An elderly senator has just returned to the Senate. She's a Democrat. Her name is Dianne Feinstein. She's pushing 90. She's been out of the Senate for some months now because she had shingles and she's finally made it back and she's in a wheelchair and she looks a bit frail and she looked a bit frail even before she left the Senate. And there are a lot of people calling for her to resign. A lot of Republicans calling for her to resign, a lot of conservatives and a lot of liberals, probably more liberals actually than conservatives. And the reason for that is because the libs want the governor in California, Gavin Newsom, to be able to appoint a much younger, more left-wing senator. Dianne Feinstein, for all her sins and problems, is not even close to the most liberal member of the U.S. Senate. And so as Dianne Feinstein gets readjusted to the Senate, I want to hear every Republican, I want to hear every single conservative come out there and say, Dianne, six more years. Six mo- I support Dianne Feinstein for re-election. I want Dan, Dianne Feinstein to be reelected th- three more times. I never want Dianne Feinstein to leave the Senate. Why is that? Some conservatives disagree with me. We'll get into a little bit more tomorrow. We're out of time now. And we've got to get to Lindsey Graham, not the U.S. Senator, someone far more exciting, Lindsey Graham, known as the Patriot Barbie. We covered Lindsey on the show some time ago. She defied the lockdowns in Oregon in 2020. She stood up against wokeness in schools. And she is coming on this show. So stay tuned. The rest of the show continues. Now, you don't want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, K-N-W-L-A-S, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans.